Customers Today with your host, Frank Sampson. Welcome everyone to Boomers Today. I'm Cynthia Perthews and I'm filling in today for Frank Sampson. And I am honored to have Kevin Spagdus with me. Kevin is the founder and owner of Neurizen at Home in Florida. Now that's a, a private duty home care services, but we're not necessarily here to talk about his business and private duty home care. We're here to talk about the staffing shortage that is in this industry and his theory and what he's doing to try to turn that around here in Florida and maybe nationwide. So Kevin, welcome. All right, thank you very much, Cynthia. Thank you, thanks for having me. Thank you. So, you know, you came into this business, um, I'd love to hear a little bit, and I, our, our listeners would love to hear a little bit about your background so we can find out, you know, why, why you are the guy who knows what we're going to do to solve the shortage, the staffing shortage. I mean, what makes you the guy? Well, um, in terms of my background, I've worked in the healthcare industry since I was 16 years old. I uh, started as a food service worker in an uh, acute care hospital and uh, worked in that setting through high school and college. My entire career um, after college was um, in leadership positions uh, that supported hospitals and senior living communities. Literally about half and half of my career, 18 years in acute care, 18 years in senior living. We, so that, that sounds, I mean, th so you've seen it all really, I mean. Yeah, well, one of my favorite role I had was a national role um, in the senior living field where we had 500 clients in retirement communities in 38 states. Uh, so we had clients, uh, Thousand Bed Hospital in New York City, all the way to a high rise CCRC in, in uh, San Francisco. So what that role allowed me to do is get exposure to a tremendous amount of innovation, a uh, tremendous amount of uh, leadership uh, and different approaches um, uh, to uh, lead and manage the senior living world. It was an awesome role. So we, like we read about it everywhere, we hear about it everywhere. You and I are in the industry, so it's a constant discussion every day about staffing shortages. And I know that our listeners have probably experienced it as well. So we're talking about this industry, which is, is the, you know, the elder care industry, if you will. Is this, a, is this an anomaly, do you think? Or I, I know you maybe you have some numbers and some things about this and it'll help us really see it from a, from a number standpoint. In our field, staffing is always um, the number one concern. Um, finding the right person, the right caregiver to match them up to um, the right client. Uh, but um, over the last couple of years, in every industry, um, labor shortage has been exasperated. Um, so if you look at the home health field right now, they're gonna, we're going to need 600,000 new home health aides now until 2030. So it's a, because of the demographics, um, uh, we have an aging population. So the need is gonna grow, uh, which is gonna drive a huge need for uh, new people in our field, um, literally 600,000 a year. And, and um, what's the deficit that you think that we can fill that 600,000? Well, I think one of the biggest issues is the turnover. Uh, mm -hmm. If you look at the turnover, it's, 70% over the past five years. And a lot of people say, oh, the COVID caused a lot of it. It's been flat. Um, 2018, it was a, a little blip, but it's been flat uh, and it averages 70% over the past five years. So the way I look at it is the key to the staffing shortage is to reduce the turnover. If organizations could dramatically reduce their turnover, then they can focus on filling positions for new need instead of uh, replacing people. Um, but 70% you so if you have a, an agency that's 100 people in it, it's talking about 70 new people a year just to stay even. And then you have new clients that you have to uh, supply support for. So the key is to reduce the turnover in my mind. Okay. Yeah, it's, it seems like a really difficult business. Why? Why? I know you did your homework before you came into this industry. If, if those numbers being so bleak, why did you decide to come into the industry? The, the reason I came in, I've always um, had a love for serving, serving seniors. When I made the switch from acute care to um, senior living, I loved the relationships we built with the residents and retirement communities. Um, and because you were with them for a longer period of time, you can see the impact you make in their lives. Uh, so when I left the corporate world, I wanted to make sure I found something that um, I would be serving that same cohort. And I've always wanted to own my own business. So I put those two things together and, um, and decided on this business. And 
To be honest with you, home health was not on my radar. In fact, when I worked in the senior living field, I had a bias against home health because I felt like it isolated the client. I saw what a great job my clients were doing in CCRCs, independent assisted living, and nursing homes as well across the country, creating socialization and how people thrive. So I had a bias. So when I left the corporate world, I said, you know what? Let's find a way to end socialization in people's homes and home health agencies. So I decided to make it a challenge versus uh, something I was a bias of mine. Right, right. No, that that is um, that's important because you know that's the that's the discussion that I have a lot about the socialization aspect of it. We know that social isolation is as bad as smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. So right. how you know, and, and as a as someone who is um, aging. You know, I don't, I know that for me, I don't need to add on a pack of cigarettes a day. So in that case, I need to stay, you know, uh, with a lot of human interaction, um, see if we can do that, if we can help with that. Cynthia, can I go back, back to the turnover piece a little bit? Yeah. Um, so I talked about it being 70% uh, in the industry and it's been a constant. Um, what I've heard a lot in our field is people blaming the environment outside circumstances for the turnover. Uh, but Home Care Pulse did a study, a, a national study with home health aides on why they left their agency. And uh, the top five reasons, four were directly related to leadership issues. Ooh. Now the top 10, seven. So 70% of the reasons people leave is leadership. Poor communication came up a lot. Um, uh, lack of integrity of the management team, um, people being put in unsafe uh, conditions, um, not being uh, supported in the field and, and other reasons. So my whole focus is creating a culture that's going to get rid of those seven things won't even prop up in our organization. Um, and our goal is to have very, very low turnover. So if organizations have, like I said, a hundred, they have a hundred if you have 100 team members, and if you can cut your turnover in half, it's 35 people, less people you have to serve uh, to hire, and then you can focus on um, hiring for new clients. So, I mean, so do, those, those, do those 70%, do they go to other home health care groups, or do they get out of the industry? Do you know that information? Uh, no, I do not. It's not fair not for me. Again, uh, <laughs> great question. Yeah, you know, what? because I know in my experience that I do see there's a lot of jumping between the agencies, which provides a, a problem for my clients because they're, they want to have um, some continuity and they want to know who's going to show up at their door that day. But one of the concerns I have that maybe we can talk about on a, on a later podcast is that some of the, those 70 that are leaving out of 100 are going into another, another field altogether. Because those 600 that we need per year, you said not counting the turnover piece of it really is, is frightening for me to know that I'm aging and I'm going to need care and there's just not going to be anybody to do it. And I think the other demographic piece is the fact that we have 10,000 people a day turn 65, but we're not necessarily birthing that many people that are taking over for those people who are coming out of the workforce. And that's why handling the turnover is so important because this, the, the uh, demographic changes um, dictate a lot more need um, and we have to have to tackle the turnover. It has to happen. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, leadership. I agree with you that the, I, I do agree with that whole um, hypothesis, hypothesis and what you're seeing in the, um, in the, the data. What about pay? It's important. Yeah, that's a basic need you have to meet up front. Absolutely. Um, but it's not the only thing. Pay did come up in this survey, but it wasn't, it wasn't even in the top five. Okay. So, okay. but it's a, it's a need that has to be met. Uh, when we interview our uh, potential caregivers, we ask them, what do you need? Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, oh, this is what we pay, what do you need? Mm -hmm. And work hard to meet that need. So it's not an issue. That issue is off the table. Then you can focus on the other needs of um, supporting the person, helping their growth, and uh, give them a, a vibrant place to work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So then if you're, if you're paying them what they need and they're honest with you, you're honest with them, they're paying you what they're, you're paying them that, um, how can you afford to stay in business uh, with your competitors? Great question. One of the things is we're not, not a franchise. Um, we, we belong to a national membership group um, that we get a lot of support resources from, but we're not a franchise. So we, have, we don't pay franchise fees. Uh, so instead of pocketing that money for our profit, we reinvest that into higher wages for our people. Uh, that's the key for us. Okay. And wh what, um, you know, I know you talked about all the different things that you have done. Are you, you seem to be a little bit of a leadership guru. Would that, do you, you think that's true? I'm a leadership junkie. I, I think I've read every book and every podcast on leadership since I was 22 years old. I still okay. do. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, that, that's great. Um, I, I wish I'd had you as a manager in some of my previous <laughs> careers, uh, <laughs> might have been. Um, so how do you, how do you impart that, um, skill onto others? Because you're only one person in your organization and you've got to build an organization. You're going to have to have people under you who have that same skill. What are some steps that you all go through that you go through in um, your hiring and in your training with your teams? Great question. First of all, um, it's all about creating a culture. Uh, creating a positive culture needs to be your number one strategy to attract and retain the best people. Uh, to answer your question directly, you set purpose for the organization. Um, and then you set guiding principles with your team. Um, how are you gonna treat each other? How are you gonna treat your clients? Um, so you're creating a really strong work environment. In terms of a selection process, we are very selective. It's hard to get into our agency. And a lot of people say, in this work environment, I said, yes. Um, who you select on your team and who your leaders are, that creates your culture. People create a culture. It's not a mission statement and a vision statement on a wall. Uh, you know, people don't see or understand. It's the people in the organization. Um, so we have a very high high standard, we call it our ideal criteria for new candidates. Mm -hmm. And they have to meet those criteria before they get selected on our team. Um, okay. So we look at things, uh, are you an avid learner? Are you creative? Are you fun and excited about what you do? Uh, compassionate, you have to be compassionate in this field. That's a given. Uh, we look at, uh, are you a team player? Can you work autonomously? We're looking for people that when they work with our clients, they can think on their own because we empower them to do it because we're hiring the people that uh, earn the empowerment and think on their own and create the best care and the best experience, the growth experience for our clients. Um, so the selection criteria is key. Also, the screening process is key. We do multiple job interviews. We don't allow one person to hire. We want different perspective, asking different questions, at different time periods. We even have our caregivers. We call them care ambassadors. Our care ambassadors are part of the interview process to help select who they want on their team to make sure they fit our culture. Um, so that's, that's, so you set these processes in place, you document them, you train people on them, and it's repetition. Then you tweak them and adjust them with feedback from others. So that, that's how we do it. Um, we have a robust onboarding process. Um, we do a lot of training, a lot of development. We do state conversations with our people, but we sit down with them on a regular basis to ask them um, what type of, do you have enough support? Do you need any uh, tools that you don't have? What are your growth goals? So we can help customize your growth plan. So instead of waiting for an exit interview, we do state conversations while the people are with us. So those are some of the things we do, but the important thing, Cynthia, you got to set the processes, document them and train people how to use them so it's not just one or two people driving the culture okay we're going to stop for a brief commercial break and then we're going to return with kevin sphagdas from new Horizon. today's sponsor is senior care authority a national elder care consulting company specializing in senior living with over 60 locations around the country senior care authority's team of certified senior advisors work in person with older adults and their families to find the best care and living options. If you have questions or need help navigating the maze of senior care and living options, reach out to Senior Care Authority for a free consultation. Go to www.seniorcareauthority.com 
to find a local representative and get the help you need. So welcome back. Um, a couple of things I wanted to ask you about that I was thinking. Um, I am a big believer in the power of vocabulary and the power of words and how we treat our clients and how we treat our peers, but how we treat our clients in this industry. And so I loved the fact that you used the word ambassadors. Tell me how you, because I know you must have developed that word and in, in calling your team members that. How did that word come up? What does um, that mean? The, the, you rep, an ambassador represents. So if you're an ambassador of a country, you represent the country you're from. Um, our care ambassadors are representing the client and their best needs. Uh, they're representing the family, what their needs are. And they're represent, re representing our organization for excellence and quality and care, um, you know, creativity, innovation, and helping people grow. So they're representative, and um, they wear that badge very proudly. Um, that's how we came up with it. That's the meaning. I, th I think it's. I just love. I love that word. It mean. It means a lot. Uh, something else that I have found interesting, and you know, we've had this discussion a, a few times. Something else I find interesting is um, is your sales process. So remember. Yes, you have a home health care agency. That's what you have. But you just bring it to the table a little bit differently. I know both with families and with partners that you work with. And I'd love for you to, 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 talk, to talk to me a little bit about how you're pitching your business. Because it's my understanding after our discussions, you're not pitching your business of going and saying, look at us, we have a home health care agency. You're pitching it differently. Yeah. So let's talk about referral partners first. Um, we are big believers in creating value first, building trusting relationships, and then the referrals will come. So we walk into a referral source and it's real funny because you sit down, what's your rates, what's your minimums? And my response is, I'm not here to talk about me today. I'm here to learn about you. I've had referral sources that you can sense it. It's a 10 minute meeting, go for an hour, hour and a half after you, um, you know, structure or communicate that that's what we're here for. So I literally spent time with the referral partner, could be an executive director, CEO, an owner of, of an adult daycare center, and ask them, what are your goals? And they sit, look at me like, what do you mean? Like, like, what are your organizational goals? What keeps you up at night? That question really hits to the point of what, what's really challenging them in their business. Uh, I take copious notes. Um, ask clarifying questions to make sure I understand. And then I end the meeting and I said, I'd like to come back and uh, look at our referral uh, resource team and see if there's any way that I can support you. Uh, we have uh, a robust team of business partners. Um, we support each other and we're able to leverage those individuals and those organizations to support the goals of uh, our clients. So I'll come back the next time, next meeting and say, hey, you had these three issues. Um, I have a resource for this, this, and this. How would you like me to connect you with them? We follow through. I come back for a second meeting, and then they said, how can I help you? And then we start a mutual relationship. So th that's our approach with referral partners. Uh, with clients and their families, we are very big on making sure clients feel very comfortable with the care ambassador that they're going to work with. Um, so we actually have them there um, before they start care, have them involved in the process, the assessment process. So they can spend time with, um, you know, a couple of hours with the uh, potential client. Sometimes we'll do a lunch meeting to make sure that um, the client and family members uh, have a good feeling about the person. Uh, so we integrate the, the care ambassador into the process to make sure they're comfortable. Um, when we work with our clients, we also ask about what their growth goals are. Uh, we work really hard on the care, providing exceptional care. And then we start when they're feeling better, stronger, um, emotionally stronger, or physically stronger, we talk of asking what their growth goals are. And that's where we provide some extra value in helping them reach the, their growth goals. So uh, that's how we work with our clients and our families. So. And their growth goals, as I understand it, maybe that they want to go to see a movie in a theater again. I have a story, if, you, if I could share a story, yeah. just to bring the point home. So we have a client um, that we started servicing. And um, during the assessment process, prior to us serving this client, 
the person um, had Parkinson's, um, she had four falls, a broken hip, broken ribs, lost half of her teeth, at three out of the four falls before we took, had, took over care. So during the assessment process, she had a time um, getting out of the chair. She had to use the walker and, and a cane. Um, so we started work with her the very next week and we um, helped her with her medications. We helped her with an eating plan, an exercise plan. And within weeks, she was the walker never left her bedroom. And she used the cane, walked around the house without a cane, went on long walks with the cane, um, built up her strength, her confidence. And we said, what, what's, what's, a, what's a, something you have want to do that you haven't been able to do? Love to do that you haven't been able to do this. I want to go to Chicago and I want to go see my grandkids. That was wow. So we use that growth goal to keep motivation and excitement around the systems we set up for her care. She's in Chicago this week, visiting her grandkids. Wow. Great. We brought her yeah, so that that's an example. That's an example of um, what we mean by growth goals and and helping our clients. Um, that that I, I just I love those stories and and I I you know I as you talk about listening to the referral partners, listening to the clients. You know I I'm a, a long term salesperson is who I really am, and I was always trained that you have two ears and you have one mouth. And that you need to listen twice as you speak. And that's an example of going to a meeting and listening to what it is that, that their pain points are, their, their things that they're having issues with, and then coming back a second meeting to really have that discussion with them. I, I just find that so valuable. Valuable. Are these... Um, are, are these items... Look, I know that this is kind of a little bit of your secret sauce for what you're doing, but I am curious, do you believe that what you're doing in, in your space, in your business, in this industry, is this something that could um, translate into other home health care agencies or other industries? I, yeah, with the right leadership and the right vision, um, and you got to be committed to it. I mean, it takes time to build a resource team. Mm -hmm. It takes, it's a longer sales cycle. With your referral partners because you're giving first and you're organizing resources so you have to stay committed to it so with someone um, that can stay committed to it uh, somebody that, that um, could build relationships with other organizations uh, with people that have um, similar values and similar visions on caring for our elders um, i think it could be done i think it could be done but it, it takes those things and you got to stick with it um, and I mean, there's day-to-day -day, um, sense of urgency issues in our business every day. You got to take care of those while you're working on the strategic things at the same time. So, yeah. Well, and again, you know, the title of this of this podcast is addressing the staffing shortage through leadership, and and it's not addressing the staffing shortage through leadership in the home healthcare industry or in the elder care space or in the. I just believe that address addressing the staffing shortage to leadership could translate into other industries as well. And we know that at this time, you know, when we're doing this podcast, we have these tremendous staffing shortages across the way. Um, I know I work with a business coach who just keeps telling me, you know, the key to success is hiring. But that's the key to success. And that key to success is hiring through good leadership. And um, I know I enjoy our discussions because it tries to get me to be a little bit better person because that's what I, I don't want to say I struggle with leadership, but I struggle with hiring. So, um, so this has been really valuable to me to hear again from you. If, if people want to get in contact you, with you now, look, there's two things here. One is they want to get in contact with you because they, they love your, your, your mantra. They love what your mission is, but, and they need some care for their parents. Um, or maybe they just want to get in touch with you because they have, they want to brainstorm with you about how they can help their staffing, maybe not your competitors, but <laughs> other people in, you know, in the space, in the space would find very, you know, would find value. Would you welcome that discussion? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. I, we, we have a, our, our, our focus is on the field. It's on serving elders. It's not just uh, myopic. So absolutely. Okay. So how does someone get in touch with you? Again, it's going to be connected to our podcast, but if you'd like to just tell us, how would they get in touch with you? Sure. Um, my email address is k 
s at newrizon.com. That's n u r i z o n.com. Um, our headquarters phone number is 239 789 4732. Um, and um, you can reach out to me at 925 856 2491. Perfect, perfect, perfect. This has been really, really a, a great time. You know, I, um, again, I just, I think there's a lot of value in what you're talking about in this strong and consistent leadership. And I think that culture is so important in this industry, especially when I see people that are, um, I see my clients who are struggling with their private care and struggling with their care in communities as well because the culture is just not there. Mm -hmm. And I think that it would make a difference, a huge difference. And so I just embrace what you're doing. I'm, I'm fascinated by it and I love it. Love it. Thank you so just, much. Just so you know. So I really, um, I really appreciate you being here with us and I'm going to take us out. Um, Thanks to the audience for joining us. Thanks, Kevin, for being here. Again, this is Cynthia Kirkman for joining us today. And join us next time as we navigate issues that affect the future generation. You've been listening to Boomers Today with Frank Sampson. To learn more about today's show, visit boomerstodayradio.com and join us next time for another edition of Boomers Today.